Okay, good morning. We're going to start. You are joining in on our Zoom presentation of Growing Tomatoes. Um, so welcome to the Ventura County Master Gardener Speaker Series. This talk is one of a series of virtual talks we have planned until we can resume our in-person meetings around the county. Today's presentation, Growing Tomatoes, will be about an hour with time for questions, but we ask that everybody stay muted and video off due to the number of people on the call. If you have a question, please use the chat box at the bottom of your screen and we will get to as many as possible. Our speaker today is Julian Hoyle. He has an extensive international background and education in agriculture, specifically seed production. Before he retired and became a master gardener, he worked for Seminus Seeds in Oxnard. In the Master Gardener program, he is a specialist on the helpline and he teaches many classes on various horticultural topics. Today, Julian will talk to us about how to grow tomatoes. We will learn about tomatoes from propagation to harvest, including types, selection, nutrient needs, growing conditions, and much more. We have several upcoming Zoom classes and a succulent wreath class coming in the next few months. Please check out our website and our Facebook page for more information and registration. And I will put that information in the chat box in a moment. Um, we also have an exciting five week webinar coming up uh, beginning Thursday, April 22nd and continuing for four subsequent Thursdays. Um, it is about trees. So if you, everything you want to know about trees, please tune into that. And again, I'm going to give you the address where you can um, register for that. So again, can everybody please stay muted and use the chat box for any questions? And I'm going to turn it over to Julian now. All right, am I on? You're on. Okay, well, welcome everybody to the talk uh, on all of our tomatoes or tomatoes. <laughs> Before we actually start, I'd just like to spend a minute talking about something that's very important to California. And that is this disease that many of you may have heard about, Australia, uh, Asian citrus psyllid, ACP, or to use its Chinese name, Huang Long Bing. It's a nasty disease affecting citrus, which is done a lot of cause a lot of damage in uh, Florida and we don't want it to do the same thing here. It's a bacterium which clogs up the vascular system of the tree effectively strangling it and so then the tree eventually dies. It's carried by a little insect called a psyllid P-S-Y-L-L-I-D and down at the bottom left here is the picture of the guy and he's very distinctive because he keeps his tail up in the air. So this is the adult Austra uh, Asian citrus psyllid. The symptoms of the uh, tree is misshapen fruit and blotchy yellowing of the leaves. It's not an entire yellowing of the leaves. Nitrogen deficiency and mineral deficiencies cause the leaves to yellow, but this is a blotching effect on the leaf and the fruit is misshapen and dry because it doesn't have any liquid in it because the vascular system has been blocked. On the top right here is a picture of the uh, nymphs, the young people, the young insects, the nymphs, and you can see they're very distinctive pushing out these funny globular things. You may also see ants on your citrus leaves uh, because the ants are protecting the psyllid from the natural predators. But the presence of ants is not just an indication of, of uh, ACP because the most common thing is that citrus trees have aphids on them which produce honeydew and the ants protect the aphids as well. But if you see uh, your tree with somewhat yellowing, blotchy leaves, misshapen fruit, take a good look if you find these insects, then contact your local agricultural department because they would need to come out and look at it. 
commercial growers are spraying the trees. And so far, although it's been found in California, it's not had a big impact yet, and we don't want it to do so. You can learn more about it by look, going onto this uh, website up here, if you wish, https colon slash slash uckr.edu, etc. You can write that down and you can get more information. One final thing, if you're planting citrus, young citrus, please don't move them around. If you're going to plant it in your garden, do so from a local nursery. Don't buy in, in another county and bring it in here because we don't want to spread the disease. So just have a good look at your backyard trees and make sure you don't have any of these, uh, these insects looking like that. Okay, let's move on to what we really hear about, which is all about tomatoes. Before I get on to that, let me ask you a question. Which countries are the biggest tomato producers in the world? Pause for a minute to think about it. Do you know which countries produce the most or which is the second? Where is the USA? How, how do we rank? Well, here's the answer. China, look at that. These are figures from the Food and Agriculture Organization, so they're pretty accurate. Don't worry about the, the figures in metric tons, but 34, a third of the world's tomato production comes from China. It's mostly for export in the form of, of uh, tomato ketchup and uh, canned tomatoes and so on, but a third of the world's tomatoes come from China. India is next at 10 percent, followed by Turkey, 7 percent. The USA, we're fourth, 6 percent of the world's uh, tomato production, then Egypt, and then finally Italy. So I thought you might be interested in that. Okay, first we're going to discuss, there are different types and classes of, of tomatoes. We're going to discuss that first of all, and then we will go on to how to grow tomatoes. So we've got types and classes of tomatoes. Let's look at the classes of tomatoes that are processor and fresh market. What's the difference between processor and fresh market tomatoes? Here is a picture of processor tomatoes being harvested. These are tomatoes for the processor industry, which is tomato ketchup, canned tomatoes, and so on. You can see here a field of tomatoes which have been grown in rows. This harvester will come along, cut the plant, take it up the elevator, the plant is shaken and the fruits fall off. This is important, the plants are shaken, the fruits fall off, they go up the elevator into the trailer alongside and from there it goes off to the factory. So you can see the fruits need to be fairly tough to be able to put up with being cut up here, transported up here, shaken, elevated, put into a big trailer and taken off to the factory. So what characteristics do these fruits have to have? So processor tomatoes, <coughs> they flower over a long period, over a short period of time, short period, because you want your fruit all to ripen simultaneously so that you can cut the plant and shake it and all the fruits are ripe. The fruits must also fall off the plant easily when they're shaken so that they'll drop off. And the fruits always have a jointless attachment, jointless attachment. Now, what is that? Here is a picture of a tomato. If I can get my cursor going. Cursor is very, very difficult, but you can see this uh, diagram on the left here, the uh, the fruit is, here is the stem, and it's completely, uh, it's just one stem, no joint in it. Here is a jointed tomato, and you can see there is an actual knee joint, which is uh, quite visible. 
what happens when a fruit is ripe and it breaks off from the plant, there's an abscission layer of cells. The cells in this one, this abscission layer, the cells are at the, <coughs> at the end of the stem and the cell walls weaken and the fruit breaks off from the stem or the peduncle on the here, on the abscission layer. In a jointed tomato, the abscission layer is in the joint. And when the fruit is ripe, this is where it breaks off so that this little part stays with the fruit. And here you can see pictures of it. Here is a jointless one. And you can see, although it's curved, there's no joint. And here is the jointed one where the abscission layer is absolutely actually visible. You can see it. Here's another picture of here is a jointless one. There's no abscission layer, at least not visible. And here is the jointed one where you can see the swollen knee joint. Now this has no effect on the yield of the, of the fruit or the taste of the fruit or anything like that. It's a genetic character and it's important for the processor industry. Here you can see a tray of jointless fruits and here you can see a, a tray where the fruits were jointed and they broke off. Now processors, when they are, have their load of tomatoes come to the factory, they don't want to have to deal with having to remove all of these stalks and bits of, of, uh, of calyx because that's going to be a, a problem in making ketchup. You don't want this in a processor. So you want to have a jointless one where your fruits will come without the joint at all. It's, as I said, it's nothing to do with yield or taste, but it is an important uh, genetic characteristic. Okay, moving on. Fruits have little juice because you don't want a lot of juice, but they have thick walls, which you want. You want the solids and that's good for salsa making. And also it's good for rough transport because you want the fruit to be able to, to withstand being put in that trailer and taken to the factory. Taste and flavor is not very important. And they usually only have two or three locules. That's another word, locule. What is a locule? Well, a locule is a little cavity where the seed is. And here is a Roma tomato, which is a typical um, processor tomato cut in half. And this has got two locules. And these are the cavities where the seeds are. This one has got three locules. You can see very nice thick walls uh, which is good for the processor industry. Okay, let's move on to the fresh market tomatoes now. They produce fruit over a long time period, which is what you want. You want to be continually harvesting your, your fruit. Has a fleshy and juicy fruit, which is what the fleshy market people want. Taste and flavor are important. So that is what, although many people who buy uh, tomatoes at the supermarket would, would wonder, but taste and flavor are important for flesh market. They can be jointed or jointless, it really doesn't matter. They tend to have a soft skin, which is good for a fresh market one, but obviously not good for transport, and is usually multilocular. And here you see the tomato, fresh market tomato with a lot of locules. This is multilocular. So here's a comparison of the two. You can see the fresh market down here, which is multilocular. The uh, processor up here, two or three locules with thick walls. Now let's look at the types of tomatoes. And there is determinate and indeterminate. Determinate tomatoes are those who grow for a short determinate period of time. And they will be a short bushy plant and they flower on a concentrated period of time so that fruits all set and ripen simultaneously. And these are the ones that are used in the processor industry mostly, because that's what you want. A short plant flowers all together and you can quickly go in and harvest it. An indeterminate tomato, on the other hand, grows for a long period of time as long as water and nutrition and temperature are adequate, obviously. 
and they flower over a long period of time. And this is what the fresh market industry wants, indeterminate tomatoes. And it's what most home gardeners like so that they can get tomatoes over a long period of time. And it is a perennial. It will, in fact, go on if you survives winter and it will grow for more than a year. But they're generally grown as an annual because usually winter temperatures and leaf diseases are limiting factors and prevent it. But uh, genetically speaking, it, it is a perennial. So a determinate tomato tends to be a short plant. An indeterminate tomato will be a very tall plant. Now, some determinate plants grow relatively tall, and these are called tall determinates. I've seen in a catalog that being called semi-determinate, there's no such thing as a semi-determinate, the same way that you can't be semi-pregnant. It's a tall determinate. So processor tomatoes are bred and developed to have a thick walls with a little juice for the processor industry. Fresh market are bred and developed to have thinner walls, more juice, better taste. So the question is, if a processor tomato is used for fresh market, does it become a fresh market? <coughs> no, it's just how you use it, of course. So if you want to make tomato sauce, use the determinate and processor type so that they'll ripen simultaneously. If you want to make salsa, use a processor type, which has thick walls. But if you want a few tomatoes for salads over a long period of time, then use an indeterminate one. Okay, heirloom tomatoes. This is something that's very popular right now. And people ask, what are heirloom tomatoes? And here's a picture of heirloom tomatoes as seen at the Camarillo Farmers Market. All different colors, sizes, and shapes. Very popular now. These are called heritage tomatoes in England. They usually always open pollinated. That means that they are not hybrids. And they're usually always indeterminate, so they grow tall, flower over a long period of time. They have a wide variety of fruit color, shape, flavor, and size, as you saw in the pictures. Fruit shapes are often not uniform. They have all different color, all different uh, types and shapes. And they're usually multilocular. Now you know what that means. Thin-walled. And they do not usually keep very well after being picked. And the fruits often crack at the shoulder. That's one of the characteristics, although some people tend to disagree with that, but frequently heirloom tomatoes do crack at the shoulder. They're more prone to diseases because they have not had disease resistance uh, bred into them. Some varieties need a lot of space. They're very, very vigorous. And these have been selected over the years for particular characteristics uh, that people want. And they perform better in some growing areas than others. And so this is important for you if you decide to grow an heirloom tomato. You have to find one that grows well in your area. And depending on who collects and sells the seeds, the characteristics could differ slightly, which is known as genetic uh, drift. I know some people who buy an heirloom tomato from one seed company and then later on would buy the same variety from another seed company and it behaves slightly differently. That's because each seed company is collecting its own and selecting for particular characteristics which it wants. And as I said, this is known as genetic drift. Here's another type of tomato, which is all very popular, which we all know now, on the vine tomatoes. And this is what we're seeing in the supermarkets all over the place. And this is this has uh, come on the market about in the last 20, 25 years. What else there? It's a, called a saladette tomato on the vine, called a saladette tomato. And saladette tomatoes have medium-sized fruit they're shaped round or oblong. They have thick walls, so they're good for cooking and also to make salsa, sauce, and so on. They're not as juicy as a full fresh market, but juicy enough to eat in the salad. They're sold in trusses or clusters, as you saw from the picture above, with three or four locules. And they can be jointed or jointless. It really doesn't matter. It's up to the particular breeder. And here's a typical saladette tomato 
which we're all familiar with. This one's got four locules, fairly thick walls, and it's good for, uh, for salads and also for cooking. So they're very popular with the supermarkets now. They need to ripen simultaneously so that you can pick a whole cluster at once and all the fruit are ripe. They must be of a uniform size and the attachment to the stalk must be strong. They mustn't fall off easily because people go to the supermarket and they want to pick up a, a cluster and all the fruit must be attached to it. So they must not break away easily. Fruit should have a long shelf life. Let me talk a little bit about long shelf life. The tomatoes, when they get old, the cell walls weaken and eventually they start to become soft and your tomato that's been on the shelf for a long time get, soon gets soft and mushy and needs to be thrown out. Well, about 20 years ago, breeders came across a gene where it slowed down the breakdown of the cell walls. And in fact, they stayed strong and, and firm for a long time, which was considerably uh, slowing down the softening process. And this is called a RIN gene. They call it a RIN for ripening inhibiting gene. And most breeders have now bred this RIN gene into the modern hybrids and into these saladet tomatoes so that the cell walls will not break down and they will stand on your shelf for two or three weeks without getting soft. And they were able to do this using regular normal breeding methods. There's absolutely no GMO, no genetically modification in it, regular breeding got this RIN gene into these uh, tomatoes and so they stay firm for a long time. Heirloom tomatoes, of course, do not have this RIN gene. That's why earlier I said they tend to uh, not stay long on the shelf life. And there's a perception that these vines are classy and higher quality, but not really. Now jointless and jointed can be on the same time. You can amuse yourself when you go to the supermarket and look at uh, the tomatoes. I have seen, I took this picture on a supermarket and here is a jointless tomato and here is a jointed tomato clusters. These are obviously two completely different varieties that or hybrids that came from the producer, but just looking at the fruit, you wouldn't know that. So amuse yourself by looking for jointed and jointless uh, fruit next time you're out. Okay, moving on a little bit. Often people ask me when they see in a catalog, they see letters after a particular variety name. And what do they mean? It means resistance to certain diseases. There are breeders have developed hybrids which are resistant to various diseases. And the common diseases are alternaria, which is AB, F for fusarium, FF for fusarium wilt races one and two, LB late blight in nematodes, T, TMV, tobacco, mosaic virus, or verticillium. These are the common diseases. And so to go back here, so celebrity is resistant to to uh, verticillium, fusarium, uh, race two, nematodes, and tobacco mosaic virus. An early girl hybrid is resistant to, to uh, verticillium and, and fusarium race two. So if you, know, if you know that you have a problem, you can look for a hybrid or a tomato with these particular letters. I'm often asked why tomatoes have dark green shoulders. Here is some tomatoes and they're starting to ripen and they have a dark green shoulder. And people are worried that it might be a problem of some kind. Absolutely not. It's just a varietal characteristic. Some fruits are uniform green when immature, others have a dark green shoulder, like this one. This is a dark green shoulder. Occasionally it may be physiological, if there's some heat problems may produce dark green shoulders, but for the most part, it is a just a varietal characteristic. 
and breeders will designate the lines in their catalogs, dark green or uniform green for people who uh, it's important. But for the home gardener, it really doesn't matter because the dark green shoulder fruits will turn completely red if left on the plant to ripen fully. So here you can see, this is in my garden. Here are these three fruits here with dark green shoulders. And by the time they ripen, here are the same three fruits it has completely gone. So you don't have to worry about dark green shoulders. It's just a varietal characteristic. This is jointed, you can see, whoops, this is jointed. You can see a nice, a nice joint here. Now, how many of you have cut open a tomato and seen this? And you see, oh my gosh, I've got worms in my tomato. Not at all. This is something called vivipary or vivipary. I'm not quite sure how to pronounce it. But when a seed starts to germinate, it's, called, it's, it's when a seed starts to germinate before it has completely detached itself from the mother plant. So in a tomato, there's a hormone called abscisic acid, which prevents the seed from germinating. That's why the seed just stays there. But if the tomato is kept too long, especially in warm environments, this hormone breaks down and then the seed starts to germinate. And this frequently happens if tomatoes are kept for a long time in a warm kitchen and uh, eventually the seedlings will actually emerge from the fruit. But it's perfectly safe to eat. There's nothing wrong with it. Here is one where it was cut open and then once it was exposed to the light, photosynthesis began to take part and the leaves started to turn green. And here's one that's actually growing out of the fruit. And in fact, if you were to pick these up and plant them, they would, they would give you a perfectly good uh, tomato plant. So if you see this, don't worry, you, could, you can eat it or just throw it away. All right, we've covered the different classes and types of tomatoes. Now let's talk about how to actually grow the tomato. So you want to choose a place which receives plenty of sunlight because if you don't get uh, enough sun, you'll get a lot of vegetation. You won't get a lot of fruit. Dig the soil deeply. Now is the time to add manure or compost if you're going to do so. And I always like to add some steer manure or compost each year just to help the, uh, um, help the uh, soil structure. Soil should be well drained because tomatoes don't like wet feet. Make raised beds if it's something that you want to do. And try to choose an area which has not grown tomatoes for the past two years because you can get a buildup of diseases uh, in the soil, particularly nematodes, and they're really bad. So don't say if a particular area has grown really well, then oh, you must continue on producing it. Try to move from place to place, certainly every two years. And if you're using a box or container, fill it with potting soil and, and so on. So now you've got to decide what variety you're going to do. Now that you know all about determinate and indeterminate processor, that's the time when you decide what it is you're going to do. Air room, hybrid, open pollinated, what have you. Do you need to select a variety with a particular disease, which I showed you earlier with these letters? And more importantly, do you have enough space? Plants should be at least two feet apart. I know sometimes you, you might buy a, 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 a six pack of seedlings and when you've only got room for three, you should really only plant three and try and get a friend to take the other three. I know it's hard to throw plants away. You can plant them closer together, but you'll end up with smaller, smaller fruits and smaller plants. So do have enough space for your tomatoes. Here is something to watch out for. If you're going to go from seed, here is a, here is a packet of seed of uh, early girl tomato. And if you look on the back, it will say days to harvest is 52. So you could think, oh gosh, that's nice. Only three, two and a half months. 
and I can get tomatoes. And here's another tomato early girl ready for use in 60 days. Again, you might think I'll get the seed and I'll have tomatoes in 60 days. Well, hang on a minute. Here is a little, uh, uh, an insert from a seedling in a garden shop where the seedling is about six inches tall. And it also says mature in 52 to 62 days. But what gives this is plant is about three weeks in the ground already. So beware that in most catalogs and seed packets, days to maturity refers to after transplanting. So that adds about 30 to 40 days after sowing seeds. So although here it says use in 60 days, in the back of the packet here, there is a little asterisk Then it does say from setting out transplants. You see here it says uh, days to harvest 60 from setting out transplants. So do, be, do uh, be aware of that. Okay, so what variety, a lot of people ask me, so what variety should I plant? Well, it's hard to say. If you're a tomato aficionado, you can get a catalog, go online to a vegetable seed company and choose the one that interests you. If you're a relative newcomer, go to a garden shop and buy seedlings. And these are the safest ones. Early girl, which is 65 days after transplant. Celebrity, about 70 days after transplant. Better boy, big boy. These are all these are all, uh, this, these three are indeterminate. Celebrity is a tall determinant. Roma is the determinate one. And if you have to just choose one, I go for celebrity. Celebrity for me <coughs> is, the, is a good, vigorous growing plant, yields well, good sized fruit, not too big. And so if, it, if you tell me just to choose one, go for celebrity. The others, you could go for uh, early girl to get fruits early, and then one of these uh, better boy or big boy to get fruits later. As far as heirloom tomatoes are concerned, I don't have any recommendations to give. I don't have any experience with, with uh, heirlooms. My suggestion is to look at the, the catalog of heirlooms, look at the characteristics and choose a couple that interest you and plant those. So can I collect my own seeds? I'm often asked, can I get my own seeds from my tomato plants and grow the same plants? Well, yes, you can, but if you collect it from a hybrid variety, you will only get 50% will be that hybrid. 25% will be like the one parent and 25% will be like the other parent. They could be good, they could be good uh, parents, they could not be. So if you want to be absolutely sure that you get the same as the hybrid, then you have to go and buy fresh plants each year or buy fresh seed, get fresh seed each year. This is of course is why seed companies remain in business. I won't go into the, into the genetics, but if you collect seed from a hybrid, Remember, only half will be uh, the hybrid. If you collect seeds from an open pollinated variety, and most of the heirlooms are open pollinated, the plants will grow to be the same. So you can collect your own seed from heirloom tomatoes and you will have uh, the same. How do I do that? How do I know if I have hybrid or open pollinated? Well, look at the hybrid and if it will either say hybrid or it will say F1. And as I said, heirlooms are open pollinated. So how do I collect my own seed? Well, select fruits which are fully mature. It's important that they be fully mature. Cut the fruit in half, scoop out the pulp with the seeds, put it in a glass jar, cover it with a little bit of paper. Don't screw it down, you want it to breathe. And keep it in a warm place for two to four days and natural fermentation because you want to break down that yellowy gr green gel which is around the seed. 
So after two to four days, it should be ready. If a skin or mold has formed, don't worry, just take this off and add water, shake it, and then carefully pour off any floating seeds because seeds that are floating on, on our lights are no good. Strain it through a sieve. You may need to do this two or three times, washing until all the traces of the pulp have been removed. Then put it out on a, on a paper plate to, to, to a towel to dry. Put it on a towel. Never use artificial heat. Don't put it in an oven or anything. You could end up killing it. And once it's dry and, and uh, will move, put it in a paper envelope. Don't put it in a plastic bag. You want to put it in a paper envelope so it can absorb any moisture that's still in the seeds. And remember to write the name of the variety on the envelope, of course. It's a mistake some people forget to do when they're collecting seeds. So that's how to collect your own seeds. Okay, so if you're going to start from seed, what do you do? Start in small trays. You can use something like an egg, an egg, uh, egg tray or just small little trays. Get finely worked soil or potting mix. Sow seed about half an inch deep. Cover it up with soil, pat it down, and uh, water it, but not too much. This is a, you've got to be careful here. If you lead to too much water, you could lead to <coughs> loss of seedlings from a disease called damping off. Remember, the top of the, of the, of the uh, soil is the one that dries out first. So you're going to need to water it fairly regularly. And if it's inside, if you've got your tray inside, you may need to water it just a little bit every day or every other day. If it's outside, you'll probably need to water every day, but just a little bit of water to keep that topsoil moist so that the seeds can germinate and grow out. Then once they are ready to transplant, be about six to eight inches tall, now's the time to transplant. So in order to get your area ready, sprinkle a little general purpose fertilizer, 10-10-10 or 16-16 or 5-5-5 over the planting area. I like to work that into the soil. Or as well, get some steel manure, as I said earlier, compost, work that well into the soil. And then water the bed so it's nicely moist. And then get your seedlings about four to six inches tall. Now this is important. You're going to remove one of or two of the bottom leaves from the stem, and I'll show you a picture in a moment. And you plant the seeds deeply, well below their original soil line, covering up the new stem with soil. And they've got to be two to three feet apart. And if you're going to use a mulch, some people like to use a mulch, now is the time to use it when you've um, when you planted it. So here we are. Okay, sometimes seeds stick together. Here is in fact a container with two seeds in it. Now it's not a twin. These are two seeds that have actually stuck together in the, in the process. So take it out of the container and you need to separate those because you cannot plant these two together because I said they need to be two to three feet apart. And the best way to do that without any damage, get a bucket of water and place the seeds in the water and move it up and down, up and down, up and down, holding it by the stems to try to get rid of and loosen all the soil from around the stem so that you end up with here are the two seedlings, all the soil has been removed and you've just got matted roots. Now grab each seedling with left and right hand at the bottom here where the stem meets the roots. Carefully with thumb and forefinger, hold each one separately. Put it back in the bucket of water and move it up and down so that the roots are sort of floating in the air and gently ease and pull them apart and you will end up with two separate seedlings here, moving them apart. So this one's got a few more roots than the others, but you see by moving them apart, there's still quite a lot of roots on each one. 
And what I like about this is I've now got two plants for the price of one, which gives me a kick. Okay, so now we're going to remove the lower leaves. Here is the seedling, and these two lower leaves have been removed. You can see here, this one that was here is no longer. This one is no longer there. This one is a different one. So I've taken these two away out. And so now I've got a much taller stem. And I plant that in the ground. Well below this is the old line that the soil was in the container. And I'm going to plant it deep up to there. So here we have, now you can see the soil is very close to that, this bottom thing. So all of this is in the ground. And what's going to happen is that this stem that's now in the ground is going to produce more adventitious roots. So your plant is going to have not only these roots, but even more roots to help it grow. And so now here we have the two seedlings planted two feet apart. And here I have dug up a couple of plants about to a couple of months after planting. And you can see here are the original roots. Here are the additional roots that came from planting it deeply. Here are the original roots and here are the additional roots. And this just gives the, the, uh, the uh, tree, the, the plant, more ability to take up soil and uh, water and nutrients. So, Tomato plants should have about four square feet to, to develop. If you crowd them too closely, the fruits are going to be small. So if you're using a four foot square garden, use two foot by two foot per tomato, support them with a wire cage, which is uh, important so they don't fall down. And uh, if, a cage, if no cage is used, a tomato plant will take up quite a lot, about nine square feet. Okay, fertilizing. People like to know about fertilizing. After the initial fertilizing and planting, and I said use a general purpose one, the next application should be about when the second flower opens. So uh, you, if, if using uh, indeterminate tomatoes, you can apply another dose after you pick the first fruits. <coughs> How much, what fertilizer do I use? Well, again, go for general purpose, 10, 10, 10, 16, 16. Or you can use one that's formulated specially for tomatoes, 5, 10, 10. Do not use a lawn for, uh, fertilizer, which is high in nitrogen, 25, 5, because too much nitrogen will give a lot of leaf and a little fruit. So you can see this one specially formulated for tomatoes is 5, 10, 10 with low in nitrogen because you don't want too much nitrogen. Now, how much do I use? Well, it's not an exact science. It all depends also what is in your soil. If you have a general purpose fertilizer, 5, 5, 5, say, you will obviously, uh, you will obviously have to use th three times as much of that as you would a 16, 16, 16 fertilizer to get the same amount of nutrients. So I just get a handful and sprinkle it and spread it on the soil, on the surface. I use one of these two and then work it in briefly with a, with a fork just to work it into the soil and then water it in. If you leave the fertilizer lying on top, you could lose some of the nitrogen, which would, which would uh, go up as, uh, as ammonia gas. So sprinkle it on the top, work it in, and then water it down. If you're using only compost or manure, that's fine. Apply that on the surface and work that into the soil without, uh, without damaging the roots. So as I said, your second dose could be when you pick the first fruits because it takes three or four weeks for fertilizer to have effect. And if you do it much later, the plant will not really have much benefit. So how much water do I use? Tomatoes don't like their roots to be very wet, as I said, so don't water over water. So if the plants are too dry or too wet, the plant can, can stress. So you know, try and give your plants just the right amount of water. 
and watered according to your soil type <clears throat> and the weather conditions. Normally, twice a week should probably be enough. Uh, if it's very, very hot, you could do it every other day. So it really depends. You have to make up your mind according to weather conditions and the soil type. Um, Watering in the morning is better than in the evening. Uh, try not to wet the leaves because that could uh, bring in disease, but in our dry climate in California, that's not quite, uh, quite so important. Now, if you come home from work after a hot day and you go out into your garden, you may see your tomato leaves are looking pretty curled up and droopy and, and limp and don't, panic that it definitely needs more water because you probably feel the same way too. Best time is to look at your tomatoes in the morning and if your fruits, if your leaves are fine and looking good and firm, then they've probably got enough water. If they're drooping in the morning, then they definitely need water. So don't worry about slightly droopy leaves uh, at the end of a hot day. If you know that you're watering the plant properly, then you should be okay. So again, water twice or three times a week, depending on the soil type and depending on the, uh, on the temperature and give it the amount of water, depending on, on how big the fruit is, the plant is. Obviously as just transplanted one will not need as much water as a plant that's a month old say, which is very big. So use your common sense. Now this is something that's important, removing the first and second flowers as soon as they appear. In nature, plants want to reproduce themselves, so they put everything they can into their first fruits and seeds in order to make sure that they reproduce themselves. Tomatoes are no different, they will put everything they can to get the biggest and best fruits of their first ones, and then once those ones have formed, they will sit back, if you like, and not give so much effort. If you remove the first uh, florets, the plant will think, oh my gosh, I really better do something, and they will put a lot of effort into producing the rest of it. So this is important, the first and second. Here is a tomato plant with the first flower and the second flower, the entire cluster. Here I have removed <coughs> the first and the second one. That's important to do that at this stage. It's best to wait until you see the second cluster before removing it, because you might remove this one and then you come back a week later and you'll see this flower and you won't remember if it was the first one or the second one, especially if you have a lot of tomato plants. So once you've got two, remove them both and then you will know that they've been done. Here's another one, first and, whoops. Here's another one, first and second. You can see here, they've been removed. First and second, they've been removed. Now is the time when you do that, you then put your cage over your tomato plant while the plant is still small and you can get the cage over it. And I like to hammer a pole, a broomstick or something down inside so as to give this uh, cage extra support so it won't fall over. Now here we have the third cluster and look at all the, look at, look at all the flowers. This is going to produce the tomato plant has realized the first and second is not going to do anything. So it is really going to work hard. Now, I'm just going to go aside briefly to peppers. Peppers, this is important. The way a pepper grows is the pepper will grow up and then it will branch, usually three branches. I'm only showing two because it's easier that this line. Then it grows a bit and then it produces more branches. Then it grows a bit and then it produces more branches. And in each, axle in, of, of the broom, it produces flowers. So here we have, in this first one here, you can see the flowers are being produced. This is the first level, this is the second level. Again, remove the first and the second level of flowers in, in the pepper. 
Take out the first one, take out the second one. Leave the third level, which is where you're going to get most of your fruit and maybe the fourth. Here you can see a bell pepper plant with there is the first flower and over here it's gone. I've taken it out. Here are the second flowers. You can't quite see them, but you can see the scars. I've taken them out. So the third flowers, these up here are the third level of flowers because the first and second have been removed. Look at the result. Look at the fruit that I got. The first flower was here was removed. The second flower was removed from here. These, look at all of the fruit that I've got here. Look at all the fruit I've got in this one. No first flower, no second flower, but look at all the, the, the ones I got from the third. But this is so funny, carrying his point. Here is a one where it was not removed. And you can see a lovely big pepper in the first node, but nothing anywhere else. Here's another one, lovely big pepper in the first node, and the plant didn't even bother to produce fruits for anywhere else. And I'm throwing this one in. This is an eggplant, which also is the same family. And here is the first flower, lovely eggplant, but nothing from these others. In fact, these flowers are quite dead. So that's for peppers, but it's, it, is, it is the same family and I thought it important to bring it in. So back to tomatoes. Pruning, pruning. Do I have to prune my tomatoes? Tomato plants do not have to be pruned. No plants in fact have to be pruned. You do not have to prune tomato plants. If you do, the plant's going to be less dense, slightly reduced fruit set because there's not so many uh, uh, branches, but the fruits will be larger because there's uh, more liquid and nutrients being sent to them. If you prune too much, you could have less leaf, co leaf coverage, which could be a problem. So you could prune a few sh side shoots when the plant is young. So if you don't prune, the plant will be large and bushy better fruit protection, somewhat smaller. So it does not matter if you prune, but you could try pruning one and not another. It just compares, see how you like it. So here I have a plant that is ready for pruning. These flowers have been removed. Here are the lower leaves and I have removed them. This one here is, whoops, hang on. This one here is no longer here. This one here is no longer here. And this one is no longer. So I've removed these three. And this is how it looks like some months later as they're growing. I've ended up with just one, two, three of these branches down at the bottom. But it's still growing very nicely with, with plenty of leaf coverage at the top here, plenty of, 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 of flowers coming. After light pruning, look at it all, still growing well. It's not too bushy. So I like this, it's not too bushy. Not, whoops, go on. Okay, now here we have, here we have now, they have produced their fruits. Look at all the fruits. They've in fact fall, fallen over the cage but I've got all of these fruits in spite of the fruit, in spite of being pruned. So for me, this is what I do, just prune a couple of the bottom side shoots. Now the problem here is now that these can be exposed to possible sunburn and bird damage. So cover it up with something. You can, I used some seedling trays I had, you could spread straw on the top, you could put an old towel on the top, but something to protect it from sunbird and the birds. And now here they are, and I've got these fruits which are ripening very nicely. You can see the indeterminate, these ones, I mean, uh, uh, right, these are ripening, these are still coming on. So this is, this is not a problem uh, for pruning, I still have plenty of fruit. So when to harvest, allow fruits to mature fully for best flavor and taste, pick, pick them in the morning. 
Never keep tomatoes in the fridge, always keep them outside. And as I said, seeing most of the ones, except for heirlooms, have this RIN gene, the RIN gene, they will not get soft. So keep them outside, they will stay, stay uh, and keep their flavor. And allow green fruits to ripen at uh, fruit uh, temperature. I've heard it said that if you're growing, if you want tomatoes to last a long time, pick them, pick them off the cluster and store them, uh, the uh, attachment end down, blossom end up. I don't know if that's true or not. Uh, some people say it is, I don't know. Uh, you could try it, but most of the hybrids don't need that because as I said, they've got the RIN gene. So everyone agrees that the best tating, tasting tomatoes are those grown by yourself, eaten a few hours after picking. Really better than the supermarket ones, which are, come from greenhouses, which are grown from plants, grown on, on uh, chemical conditions, almost like hydroponics. So your own grown tomatoes really do taste good. So just take a quick look at some of the pests and diseases that are encountered during growing tomatoes. This is probably the most common one that people have, where the ends of the fruit go black and go round. And this is called blossom end rot, where the end of the fruits go. It's caused by poor calcium uptake as a result of inconsistent watering. You need to be consistent in your watering. So try to be more regular in your watering. Use mulch if you can to minimize water loss. But by the time you see this problem, trying to add extra calcium is too late. If it's a regular problem, add lime to your soil for the next crop. Now, some varieties are more prone for this than others. Uh, and in heirloom tomatoes, you might find some varieties are more prone to it. So trained to, you could try a different variety. So if you see it now, it's too late. So what you might want to do for next year is to get ahead of it and give your plant some calcium uh, concentrate. You could do so now if you see it, but the best time is to do it when the plants are young. There are two products that I've come across. This one, Folly Cal, and this one, Maxi Cal. So you would make a solution of one of these, follow label directions as to how much of the product to put in water, and spray your young plants. Probably the best time would be just about first flowering time and then every two weeks after that, and hope that that will give the plant enough uh, calcium. Spray the leaves, uh, and then if you, you can either keep, the, keep the, the liquid for the next two weeks or just pour it on the ground afterwards, but thoroughly wet the leaves with, uh, with one of these, and hopefully that that will stop your blossom end rot. Um, do follow label directions. Don't try and make it more concentrated than the instructions. You want this one? So the next one is this, which is a very common one. This is sun scald, where fruits have been exposed to the sun. There's really nothing you, you can, all you can do about this is if you see your fruits exposed, cover them up like I did with uh, a ceiling tray or straw or, or um, towel or something. It's perfectly fine to eat. You could just cut off the sun scald bit and you're perfectly safe to eat the rest of it. There's no problem with that. So caused by exposure fruit to the sun, especially if you've pruned it too much or a sudden increase in, in, in daytime heat. So protect the uh, uh, fruits if you can. Julian? Julian? Here, yes? I have a question. I have the, I think, um, is there noise in the background where you are? Is there what? Are there people talking in the background? No. Oh, okay. We're hearing a lot of background noise, and so we're trying to figure out where it's coming from. No, there's no, no nobody. My wife and daughter in the room, but they're absolutely quiet reading. <laughs> Okay, I've, all right. I've even unplugged sure. my telephone so it wouldn't wouldn't call. 
Okay, so if everybody that's on this call could please, please mute yourself because it's very distracting. And that's all. Thanks, Julian. Okay, no, we, 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 were, we were prepared for that and we're absolutely quiet here. <laughs> <laughs> Just wanted to ask. Thank you. Okay. All right, next one is powdery mildew. This is a fairly common one. And you can see on the leaves here, it looks like you might have sprayed a little bit of powder on it. Eventually the leaves will go yellow like this. It's a common disease in California. It's not usually a big, big problem. Try to grow plants in a sunny area. And this is why you should try avoid wetting the leaves when you're watering the plants. A lot of people have sprinklers and so the leaves are going to be wet anyway. And so that is conducive to powdery mildew. You can spray with your own uh, fungicide, if you like, baking soda, horticultural oil or sulfur to prevent the spread. But it's, some, it's something most of us just live with. The tomatoes will get it uh, and try, and I will give at the end of the talk, how much baking soda to, to spray. Um, but you could try spraying with horticultural oil or sulfur, but it's just something that is, is, is fairly common, but not usually a big problem. Early blight, there are two blights, early blight and late blight, where the leaves get this black blackening on it. And this is a really advanced uh, case of, of late, of early blight. Again, the, where black or brown spots appear on the leaves can occur if weather conditions are cool. Again, avoid wetting the leaves and remove and destroy disease foliage <clears throat> if you have a lot of it. And then you've got late blight, which is pretty much the same. Very difficult to tell the difference. Only a plant pathologist could do so. Again, you can see pretty much the same. The symptoms are the same, early and late blight. Lesions appear on the stems and eventually the plant dies again. Avoid wetting leaves to spread the disease and remove and destroy disease foliage. It's something those of us who grow tomatoes have to put up with. You just hope that it doesn't come in too soon. There's not a lot you can do. Tomato fruit worm makes a hole in it. Here's the guy eating the hole. This is the same pest as corn earworm that people, when they buy sweet corn, they pull back the ends of the sweet corn to see if they can find a worm inside. That's the same guy that eats the tomatoes. The larvae eats the leaves and fruits. It's difficult to control because the larvae is inside the fruit. But you can hand pick to remove the larvae if you see them. You could spray if you see some eggs, spray with BT spray or neem oil. Both of those are organic. You can get a, a, a BT spray or neem oil. Natural predator wasps try to keep the uh, populations down. It's not a big problem, but if you see it, you could try spraying in order to uh, get the leaves. Tomato leaf miner is something, again, nearly all of us who grow tomatoes encounter. This is a close-up of the leaf, and this, this is what you see when you see on a typical tomato plant. And what it is, is, is a, it's a tiny larvae which tunnel between the leaf surfaces while feeding, leaving winding trails. And you can see here, the larvae, you can see the trail as it's gone along, eating its way through. This is really quite a, quite a pretty picture. But you cannot control it because they're protected. They're right inside and spray on the top and bottom will not reach the worm. You could try trapping the adult fly with a yellow sticky card. We could tolerate moderate damage and remove badly affected leaves. But for the most part, there's nothing you can do. We just have to put up with it. And if you get really bad cluster of leaves that are infected, pinch those off and remove them. But otherwise, we'll just have to tolerate it. So this guy, some of you have seen it. I found it on my tomato is this, it's a hornworm. He's a huge guy. And if you see him, remove him right away because he has a voracious appetite and can eat a lot, and remove a lot of leaves. 
So pick him up and get rid of him, however you want, put him in a bag in the trash, what have you. Uh, if what uh, if it's it's not too easy to see because he's quite well camouflaged, <clears throat> but if you suddenly see a lot of leaves missing, being eaten, look around for something like this. This on the right is interesting. I've never seen it, but this is in fact is a wasp, is a predator wasp laid its eggs on this hornworm, and the eggs are going to hatch, and the larvae is going to go inside the worm and feed before emerging so of course it kills the worm so if you see this this is a good guy so you need to keep him leave it like that because the worm is the hornworm is not going to do any more damage he's he's toast he's going to be eaten and these guys are going to emerge as good predator wasps which will prevent future infections i've never seen it but if you should come across it this is good guy i mean the, the, the wasp is a good guy, but this person does a lot of damage. Okay, there are other diseases, molds, viruses, and so on, but we've covered the most common ones, and there are other insects, aphids and mites and white flies, but again, we've covered the most, uh, the most common. Uh, aphids, you can spray with uh, insecticidal soap. White flies is a difficult one, is you can, you can hose your your, uh, if you have a lot of it, hose your tomato uh, plants down with water to try and wash them into the ground. You could shake the uh, tomatoes and try and get the white flies to fly up in the air and then spray them with an aerosol insecticide. Uh, but we've covered the most common ones. So how to make your own, if you want to make your own sprays for fungicide, you could mix a teaspoon of baking soda in a quart of water with a few drops of cooking oil to help it spray. So baking soda is a fungicide. It will kill the actual spores that are on the leaf itself, but it will not prevent future infection. So you need to spray your plants every week or every two weeks with this fungicide. It just kills what is already there. An insecticide, you could mix two teaspoons of dishwashing soap like Dawn in a quart of water. Do not use laundry or automatic dishwater. It must be the sink dishwashing soap. And again, add a few drops of cooking oil. And this is good to spray on your plants for aphids and things like that. It, uh, it works by dissolving the protective layer of uh, wax around the aphid, which then dries up. So growing tomatoes, a friend sent me this that said is the best way to devote three months of your life to saving $2.17. There is a lot of work going uh, to, to, uh, to save this money, but it does taste so much better and it does feel so good to eat tomatoes uh, grown from your own garden. So now you know all about tomatoes, probably more than you even wanted to know. But before taking questions, if you have gardening questions, you can send an email to helpline at mgventura at ucdavis.edu. We'll try to answer them if possible, attach pictures. So go to this website, attach pictures to identify your problem, mgmastergardenerventura at ucdavis.edu. And I'll leave this on just at the end, but one more. This is for people in Ventura County. If you want to become a master gardener, we do have master gardener training classes every two years to start. So to start the application process for this upcoming class of 2022, where the classes will actually start in November, 2021, go to this website here, and you've got to sign up there and you'll get information on dates and times for meetings that are going to be held on this date. But this is only for people in Ventura County. So here they both are together now for gardening questions. Send an email with pictures to this address. If you want to become a master gardener, go to this address and sign up to receive it. 
So it's a little more than an hour, but there we have all about tomatoes. And I'm open for questions. Okay. Um, the first question we have, I'm just going to go backwards here. Um, is there any treatment for septoria leaf spot? For septoria what? Leaf spot. Leaf, I didn't get the word after leaf. Spot. Spell it. S-P-O-T. Oh, leaf, so septoria, <laughs> sorry. Septoria leaf spot. I don't think so. I think that's a, I think septoria leaf spot is a seed borne disease. And I don't think there's anything that you can do for it. I, I, I would need to check that out. I think septoria is a seed borne disease uh, and it's not a good disease, especially if you're collecting if you are collecting seeds, if you want to, if your plant, by the way, if you are taking, picking fruit to collect seeds, say from heirlooms, try to get it from a plant that does not have disease. I don't think there's anything for septoria. I think it's seed borne and I don't think there is, but I, I, I don't know for sure. Okay, what else? Okay, hang on, hang on. Um... I tried to come across most of the ones that I was expecting, which was pruning and fertilizing and water. Yeah, and you so did. These are, these are a little different. Does BT harm ladybugs or other beneficial insects? Yes, I believe so, because it is an insecticide. I mean, uh, Bacilla, BT is an insecticide. I mean, it is an insecticide. So as far as I know, as far as I know, it is an insecticide. So if it comes in contact with them, I think it would. I think it would. Okay, uh, if you have mildew and all of the leaves come off, should you cut the branch off? If you have what? Mildew. 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 No G? Mildew. Oh, if you have mildew, oh, but powdery mildew. Yeah, if you have powdery mildew, go on, should you? And if all the leaves come off, should you cut the whole branch off? Oh, if all the leaves come off, then if all the leaves come off, then yeah, then you can cut the branch off because obviously there's nothing there. But right, if you have powdery mildew and all the leaves are off and you've got a branch without any leaves on it, then it's not going to do any, anything more Then yeah, then you could cut it off. Okay. If I want to prune a dwarf indeterminate plant, do I do it the same way as I was would prune a regular indeterminate plant? I've not come. I don't. I've not come across a dwarf indeterminate plant. I I, I was not aware that there is a dwarf indeterminate, but um, I would I would suppose so. Yes, uh, because it's the same. It was growing the same as a regular as a regular indeterminate plant. Uh, but I don't know how, I've never come across a dwarf in, a dwarf in, a dwarf tomato plant this is. This must be a, a dwarf tomato plant. I've, I don't know, I've not come across a dwarf indeterminate plant. That's, I, <laughs> <laughs> I would, I would, I, I would suppose you could take off one or two, uh, but I mean, if it's dwarf, it, it may already have uh, it's not going to produce too many branches. Wait and see how many branches it produces before deciding to, to prune it. Okay. Um, now you were talking about uh, removing the flowers. Yes. This person wants to know if you should pinch the top of the plant also. Oh yes, that was a question. No, definitely not. Uh, do not pinch the top of the plant because you're stopping it growing. There was a question asked about, should you pinch the top? Oh, I somebody also suggested pinching the top of an indeterminate plant. No, if you pinch the top of an indeterminate plant, then you're going to stop all further growth and you negate the whole point of an indeterminate plant. It will then, it will start to produce a few more side shoots but the whole point of an indeterminate plant is that it keeps on growing and keeps on growing and gives you flowers and fruit over the length of the, of the, while the plant is growing. If you pinch the top off, you're going to stop further growth. So you might just as well get an indeterminate one in that case. 
So I do not like the idea of pinching the top of an indeterminate plant because then you're going to stop further growth and, and you lose the benefit of an indeterminate plant. Okay. Um, this person has potted, oh no, has planted their plant in potting soil. Do they need to add manure or fertilizer at the beginning? Say that again. This person has? They've planted the tomato in potting soil. Right. Do they need to add manure or fertilizer at the beginning? Okay, probably not, 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 well, not manure. It depends on the, on, on the potting soil. They need to look at the container of the potting soil and it will usually say what it contains in the way of, of uh, percentage of N, P and K. Uh, usually potting soil does not contain a lot of nutrients. And you might see that it will say something like contains one, two, two, or one percent nitrogen, or two percent of P and K, which is pretty low. So I would still add some fertilizer, yes, but look to see what the container of the potting soil says is in it. They usually the potting soil contain a little bit of nutrients, but not usually a lot. So I would add some fertilizer, yes. Okay. Do you know what variety is used for the United Kingdom salad market? The United Kingdom salad market? <laughs> no, no, I have no idea. No idea what kingdom is used for the United Kingdom. No, I, I have no idea. I mean, this would be, this would be some kind of uh, uh, you know, English or United Kingdom uh, varieties and so on that are grown there. No, I have no idea what's used there. Okay, and, what what temperature should it be outside to begin planting? What temperature should it be outside to begin planting? Well, you certainly don't want it, it freezing. It's uh, planting uh, the transplants. You could do the transplants now because although it's getting cool at night, although it's getting down to 40 degrees at night, you certainly don't want it much lower than 40. You, if it freezes, then you, it, it will be a damage. It will damage it. So I would say around now is fine where the temperature is getting around 40 degrees uh, and above, it's fine. If it's below 40, the plants are just not going to grow very, very fast. That's all, they're just gonna sit there. You certainly don't want freezing temperature and you don't want it to get uh, below 40 if, if you anything above 40 should be okay. Okay. But that, um, that is you... Fahrenheit for those in case there are centigrade people listening. <laughs> <laughs> um, what is the best tomato variety to grow in Oxnard? Well, as I said, it all depends. It all depends if you know what it is you want. Go for celebrity. You know, I use I grow. I have grown early girl, big boy, better boy, celebrity. They all do well. Celebrity okay. for me is the better one. Is the is the if you're going to choose one, get celebrity. If if that's all you're going to get, it's that's it has a wide tolerance of conditions. Okay, um, if. Using a fabric pot, what size container would you recommend for a plant, a tomato plant? Using a fabric pot, you mean how many gallon container? Probably, yeah. You know, it, it all depends how much how much you are going to look after it. You know, it, it, you could grow. Okay, let me back up by saying in the in the um, in the greenhouses where commercial producers in greenhouses, they grow a plant in something no bigger than a concrete block. But because they are giving in fertilizer and, and, and water nutrients every 15 minutes, the plant is never, is never shy of food and, and nutrients. The same goes with us home gardeners by gr growing a tomato in a bucket, in a container, or in a plastic bag. It depends how big a bag or a container you want. The bigger, the better. But if it's small, that's fine. You've just got to water it more frequently and feed it more frequently. So you have to 
have to do this according to how much time you will put in it. You could use a five gallon container and that would be good. Uh, or you could use a, if you use a two and a half one gallon container, you're going to have to water it more frequently, not as much water as a five gallon one, but you're going to have to water it frequently and give a, a little bit of fertilizer more frequently. So it's really up to you what you feel you can manage. So, you know, I, I, I can't say it, use a five gallon one if, you, if it's too big for you. So it's really up to you what you want to do, do and, and, and how frequently you want to go visiting your plant. Okay. Okay. If my tomato plant has many flowers, but they don't develop fruit and there is adequate sun, what could be causing that? Okay, if you have a lot of flowers and fruit, very often it's heat, heat related. If it gets very, very hot, I know we have, we have uh, periods time, not right now, but uh, later on in August, September, when tomatoes suddenly just don't produce uh, uh, fruit. If it's very, very hot, then that causes the, the fruits to abort. If it's got enough water and enough leaves and enough coverage, it could be, could be heat related. That's usually what it is, is heat related. And not much you can do about that. Tr try shading it perhaps with a, something, but because uh, tomatoes are self-pollinating, so they don't need uh, any insects to pollinate them. So you can cover the flowers or fruit. Okay. Um, can you speak to companion plants to tomatoes? Not really. I'm not a big believer in companion plants. Uh, I think a lot depends on, on your soil and your, and your condition, uh, how you're growing it. And so I really, you know, don't think companion plants uh, uh, do a lot. And so I'm afraid I, 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 can't, uh, I can't answer that one. Okay. Um, how about, can you speak to dry farmed tomatoes? Dry farm tomato? Yes. What's, what is dry farm tomato? I don't know. <laughs> so the question from somebody, if, they, if that person wants to write in the chat box what, they're, what they mean, um, what we can... Farm tomato is. Yeah. Um, somebody wants to know about pinching off suckers. Pinching off suckers, well, yeah, uh, you mean suckers, if the suckers from the roots or suckers from, I mean, suckers would normally come up, come up from the roots. And if they come up from the roots, yeah, pinch them off. I've not seen them before, but normally, you know, I haven't seen many instances of suckers on tomatoes. You've got side branches. On my pictures I showed down at the bottom, those were side branches, not suckers. And I took those off. Suckers okay. usually come grow from the from the soil. Uh, I've not seen them. If if you do see them, yes, cut them off. I don't think they would do any good. Okay. Um, okay. So we've got a little more information about dry farming. Um, this person says that in Northern California, which I'm not sure we can speak to since we're in Southern California, but the she says that. Um, they cut the water off after a certain point so that the tomatoes are dry farmed. Okay, uh, right. I, as you said, I can't speak too much about that at all. After a certain point, you cut, if you cut the water off the tomato, uh, it will then depend, the tomato will then grow with whatever's left in the soil and whatever much growth it is. And it will grow for as long as it can taking water from the soil. And if you're not allowed to, to water it again, then I guess eventually the plant will die from lack of water. But that's not something I have any experience with or, or knowledge of. Okay, it looks like we answered all, right. all of the questions and it's, uh, it's 11.30, so we need to end. And thank you so much, Julian. You've got a lot of compliments on your talk. Okay, thank and, you. And um, everybody be sure to look at our website and to sign up for more classes. We've got a lot on our calendar. Okay, thank you for enjoy talking. Thank you, Julian. Okay.